podcast. Welcome to the Avram Davidson universe, where you will get to listen to some of the best short stories ever written. As a youth, Neil Gaiman fell in love with Avram's stories. Philip K. Dick adored him. Ursula Le Guin thought his tales wonderful, and Ray Bradbury compared him to Kipler. Each episode will include a special guest, an amazing short story, and a discussion of that story. Enjoy classic tales such as Or All the Seas with Oysters, The Golem, The Sources of the Nile, and many others. How could you be? It sounds like a story to me. Yeah. Sounds like a story to me. We have another exciting episode of the Avram Davidson Universe. Today's guest is John Kessel, who is a Nebula Award winning author uh, for the book Another Orphan, which I actually just purchased. I'm really looking forward to reading it. He also wrote uh, The Moon and the Other, as well as Pride and Prometheus. We're going to be listening to Fade Out, which is probably one of the most uh, requested stories in terms of uh, fans wanting to listen to it. Uh, it was originally published in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction in 1963. As always, please join the fan club, www.avramdavidson.com. Please write some reviews. Please share with others about the podcast. And please feel free to buy a uh, audiobooks, books that we're going to be publishing very soon. And with that said, I will be in, uh, introducing John Kessel momentarily. Thanks so much. John, thank you so much for joining. Oh, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> well, I'm going to start with, I love growing up, Moby Dick huh. was one of the first big novels that I ever read. Uh, I think fifth grade, I mean, and I was really, wow. yeah, wow. I just love that book. And I read it again after later on. Uh, so I, I'd love to start with, you know, you're a Nebula award winning author, another orphan. I just ordered it. It's on the way. I can't wait to read it, but I'd love to learn about that. Uh, learn about some of your other books as well as what you're, maybe you're up to these days. Well, uh, you know, I've been writing science fiction uh, and fantasy a long time, and uh, I, I would, I'm, I'm a retired, recently retired uh, professor of English at North Carolina State University. Uh, but uh, I, uh, uh, when I was in grad school in the '70s at the University of Kansas, I took a seminar on on uh, Hawthorne and Melville, and I became a huge Melville fan. I'd already read Moby Dick earlier, and it hadn't quite caught with me and then I read it again it was like four years later and I was amazed how much better it had gotten <laughs> I, I had grown up enough to, to so I'm really impressed that you read it uh, in fifth grade that's that's great so uh, then I got this idea to uh, to write a story about a contemporary character who finds himself wakes up on page one in uh, on the Pequod and having read the book uh, uh, before as a in college he knows that at the end everyone dies except for Ishmael and he doesn't know how he's going to get out of this so that that was just the basic idea I had in the late 70s and I sat down and wrote it uh, the novella was originally part of my uh, uh, dissertation at the University of Kansas. Wow. And so I was very uh, happy to get it published in FNSF. It came out in 82 and it won the Nebula. Uh, it was my first nomination and my my first award. It was, uh, uh, you know, like a guy who goes up from the minors and goes to his first at bat, hits a home run, and then strikes out for the next 10 years. Okay. <laughs> so. I mean, to me, and I, you know, I know right now, uh, uh, books are hot right now in terms of being adapted to me that what a what a movie that would make in my mind again i haven't read it yet so yeah, I, yeah. I can't say to it but the story the idea is just incredible and fascinating well there's actually a, a filmmaker both a screenwriter and a director who has been interested in the story and supposedly was i said he had it was okay with me if he wanted to write a spec script on it but i haven't heard anything more about it this is a well-known guy i won't mention his name but anyway uh you know i'm not holding my breath you know how hollywood is uh yeah no as, I know. As we'll find out as we talk about the story yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
and then you, I know you had some other other books as well, uh, The Moon and the Other and Pride and Prometheus. Yeah, those are my two most recent books. The Moon and the Other is a big science fiction novel set on the moon in the 22nd century about gender issues, really. Uh, and I enjoyed that a great deal. And then Pride and Prometheus is a kind of mashup of uh, of uh, Pride and Prejudice, characters from Pride and Prejudice and Frankenstein. And uh, uh, you know, I, I I take inspiration often from classic literature, and uh, I like to write these things. So some people would call it uh, literary fan fiction. Uh, some people call this stuff critical fiction, where you enter into the world of a story, and in the process of telling a new story, you uh, you you comment or you you make a, a things about the original story uh, evident that might not otherwise have been there. Anyway, I've written quite a bit of that kind of stuff, and also historical. Uh, of fiction or fantasies, fantasies that have historical elements. I, I tend to go that way, as as Avram did in, in, in many of his stories. I think he was must must have been inspired by history a lot. Oh, absolutely. You know, I guess let's dive into. Well, actually, before we dive into Avram, anything anything coming soon that we should be aware of? I should uh, let me. Uh, I have a story collection called The Dark Ride. Uh, it's going to be out from Subterranean Press in uh, early next year. Okay. And it's a career retrospective book. So it basically is the best of John Kessel. It's got 20 stories in it, ranging from novellas to sh very short stories. Uh, actually, Another Orphan is in that, going to be in that collection. Oh, wow. And, and I so wait, uh, I should have waited. <laughs> well, it's a, it'll be a great book, uh, I think. I'm, I'm really very proud of uh, uh, the collection. I, you know, I published probably 65 stories in my career. And so the top 20 are pretty good. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, so talking about Avram, how did you first discover Avram and, and uh, you know, and, and your thoughts on Avram? Well, uh, you know, it's it's really uh, weird that uh, you should ask me to be on the podcast because the very first science fiction magazine I ever bought was the October 1963 uh, fantasy and science fiction. And, and uh, here's my copy. I bought this at Cosentino's Delicatessen in, uh, in Buffalo, New York. Uh, right after my uh, my thirteenth birthday, and uh, and there on uh, the title page is uh, "Fade Out" is one of the uh, stories that was in that that issue, and so I uh, that's how how I first ran into him. And I was a, a real uh, a stone science fiction uh, fan uh, as a kid, and read everything I could get my hands on. Uh, I subscribed to the magazine. Well, in that time, Al Avram was the editor of Fantasy and Science Fiction, and he wrote uh, many book reviews, and he frequently had stories in there. And so I read stories in the magazine. I also read many anthologies uh, and read a lot of his stories uh, at, at, that were collected in various books. Uh, so throughout the 60s, I was, I was reading mostly his short fiction as it, as it came to me. I think I had a copy of his collection, What Strange Stars and Skies. Yep. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I didn't I didn't follow him into the novels. OK, so I, I, I didn't read the novels. And as as years went by, I, I, I saw less of his work. So uh, but but I remember as a teen, that was a he was one of the writers I, I uh, encountered regularly and liked. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, in, in terms of funny, in terms of the novels, I mean, he's you know, obviously more well known for his short stories uh and then phoenix and the mayor is is a very very well respected novel uh but there are a couple of unpublished ones that were were getting published that are incredible uh so hopefully you'll have an opportunity to to check those out i, I should do that yeah actually <laughs> one of the things i'm doing now that i'm semi-retired is going back and reading things that i just never got around to reading it's fun yeah <laughs> yeah so so, so one of one of your favorite stories, I imagine, is uh, "Fade Out." Uh, it is. Uh, you know, I I uh, uh, I, mean, I think when you asked me to be on the podcast, I said originally we were going to talk about. I was going to talk about a different story, and then I said, "Hey, you know what? What about the story Fade Out?" And I don't know that that was originally on your list, but uh, but you you said okay, and I I uh, I, I really do like this story. Yeah. But, so so it was interesting. There were stories that I had already done, and I have not produced uh, what Strange Stars and Skies yet. So usually I'm following different anthologies, but I would say one of the most requested stories that that people ask for on an individual basis, aside from the 
you know, where all the seeds with oysters and the golem and, and the ones that are, are really well known fade out is really popular. Uh, huh. and, uh, well, and oh, go ahead. I mean, maybe it has something to do with the Hollywood connection, you know, and, the, uh, you know, it reminds us of, I mean, the character of Philip Farnell is sort of, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, actors we know, uh, that we saw in films like, uh, Bela Lugosi or, or, or rather, uh, Peter Lorre playing the henchman in, in, in old films. And, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 it's the easy story to, to, uh, hook into, it seems to me. Yeah, yeah. no. And, and as I re I'd read it a while ago and I was reading through things very quickly as I've been getting my arms around everything and reading it a second time and then listening to it and then reading it a third time. Oh, my, it, it grew on me every single time. It does have uh, uh, depths that, that come out, I think, after you read it, when you, you know the plot and you know how it's going to end. And then you, you start to see these things that Avram was doing with the characters and the setting and the milieu. You know, and now I don't know if we should talk about the story before we hear the, the, the I, reading or not. I, I say let's, let's get into the story okay. and, then, uh, and then we'll talk about it after. I'd like, I'll, I'm going to look forward to that. Yes, let's right. do that. Let's go for it. One second here. Fade Out In an old brown house on Cherimoya in the foothills of the canyon-cut range which parts the valley from L.A., in short, in Hollywood, in between a chiropractic college which had no charter and the premises of an unfrocked rabbi who now practiced as a marriage counselor, lived Philip Farnell, world-famed star of stage and screen. P. Farnell was a lovable and God-fearing little man who was so far from chicanery in any form that he even mailed back to the general telephone system the occasional dimes and extra change which came his way in coin boxes. Nature, however, had endowed him with a ratty and evil face, surmounted by a bulging skull, sparsely adorned with hair and divided by a mouthful of irregular and jutting teeth. On the strength of the ancient and time-tested axiom, if life hands you a lemon, make lemonade, Phil had sought and obtained work as a moving picture and theatrical villain. Success on the peripatetic stage had been moderate and full of interest, but when in 1925 Philip Farnell first saw Hollywood, when he observed the great studios looming like cathedrals amid the orange groves, when he looked upon the palaces of the great stars gleaming alabaster and graced with cypresses, roses, and bougainvillea as the villas and latifundia of ancient Rome, Seeing the great people themselves riding by like the wind in their great custom-made cars, red, white, mauve, cerise, pearl gray, and shocking pink, he said a farewell to the footlights and the one-night stands, and even the occasional parts in New York successes. He turned up at the office of a reputable agent with his skills and his scrapbook, and within a week he was playing a disreputable sidekick to Noah Beery in a motion picture involving saloons, stagecoaches, and kidnapped school teachers. He never had more than a secondary role in a grade A picture, but he often was the lead scoundrel in B films. Dishonest guardians, chain gang captains, corrupt politicians, the boss of the turpentine camp, the brains of the bank robbers. Between 1925 and 1950, Philip Farnell was employed in an average of three pictures a year. He was sober, diligent, amiable, dependable, and he had many friends and no enemies. He knew the great and mingled with them without being one of them. And it did not at any time occur to him to snub or be snide to cameramen or stage carpenters or wardrobe people or yes-men or writers or script girls. The wheel turned. Those who were low in 25 in 35 were often high and vice versa. Secure in his many friendships and his own well-deployed, if modest, talents, Farnell was always in work. In 1950, the wheel made its last turn for him. The television was abroad in the land. The handwriting was on the wall. The doom of the bee pictures was sealed. In neither spectacles nor horror films was there a place for him. 
He accepted the situation calmly and without railing. Farnell was frugal, though never niggardly. He had saved, he had invested, bought, and sold. He continued in his retirement to do so. He now owned the old brown house on Cheramoya, which was subdivided into apartments, as well as the building occupied by the chiropractic college and the premises of formerly Reverend Dr. Bernardson, the marriage counselor. He collected stamps and coins and science fiction magazines and dealt commercially in all three as well, in a small but profitable way. He had thus enough money for his needs and pleasures and was in some hopes of obtaining more through the reruns of old films in which he had reappeared and which were now appearing on TV, although at too late an hour for Philip Farnell to care to watch. One beautiful June day, when the smog had lifted and it was possible from the hills to see as far as Inglewood or Culver City, Mr. Farnell, who had been shopping in the great supermarket on Hollywood Boulevard and was walking home, his one eccentricity, was hailed by a passing motorist whom he recognized with pleasure as Malcolm Morris, an old-time wardrobe man. Wait there for me, Phil, will you? Morris called. I'll park and come back. Farnell replied that he would meet Morris in the coffee shop nearby, and the latter nodded and drove off. Over coffee and sweet rolls, the two old acquaintances chatted for a while, discussing various friends, living and dead, and then their eyes met full on for a second. Morris dropped his gaze to the tabletop and began to draw circles out of a little puddle there. It always gave Farnell a small but definite pleasure to encounter in real life a cliché out of the movies. And so it was with a certain sober relish that he inquired, What's on your mind, Mal? Mal gave a nervous laugh, hesitated, then said, awkwardly, but doggedly, A couple years ago, Phil, there was an incident in all the papers of a man turned up alive after everybody, including his whole family and the law enforcement agencies. They had all believed him dead. He was out fishing. This man was out fishing, and the boat was found overturned, and eventually they turned up this body, which was identified as his and buried as his, and then, after I forgot how many years, he turned up alive in another state, and he had run off with this woman who worked for him, and they were living as man and wife under an assumed name. And the real body belonged to somebody else and had no connection with the incident. He had faked the overturned boat so he could run away with the other woman without anyone looking for him. Farnell nodded slowly. I remember it now, yes. Didn't the insurance company try to get back the life insurance money they'd paid the legal wife at the time? How did it finally turn out? Morris shrugged. No idea, he said. I just mentioned it as an example. What I mean is, Phil, do you believe that a similar incident could have been staged here in Hollywood? I mean, it is possible, isn't it? Philip Farnell considered the question as he sipped his coffee. Whom did you have in mind? He asked. Oh. Morris hesitated, made some more circles, joined them to form figure eights, pursed his mouth, and then dropped the dumb show altogether by lifting his eyes to Farnell's and saying rapidly and defiantly, S. Maxwell Pierce. No, said Farnell at once, absolutely not. You don't think so? There was a disappointed, almost pleading tone in Morris's voice. Then, challengingly, he demanded, Why not? Why is it so impossible? Tell me that, Phil. I could tell you. Farnell cut in. I don't care what you could tell me, Mal. I'll tell you why not. Sam Pierce didn't disappear on any fishing trip. He dropped dead in his home in Beverly Hills the day before Pearl Harbor. He was pronounced dead of a heart attack by his personal physician who had been attending him for his heart condition and for his ulcers, namely Dr. William Allen Albine, a man of the utmost integrity. That's why not. Morris wasn't convinced. He could have been bribed, he said. Dr. Albine? Are you out of your mind? You know better than that. Why, the man is incorruptible. Listen, Mal, you know and I know that a certain 
actress got down on her bended knees and offered him $10,000 to perform an illegal operation, and he refused. And she offered him fifteen and twenty, dollars and finally $25,000 because she trusted him and was afraid to trust anybody else. I know, I know. And he not only refused, but he talked with her the whole night long, and he talked her out of it. And she had the baby, the delight of her life. And she blesses the name of Dr. Albine every day of her life. So, Morris said, but that was a different situation. Farnell went on to point out that they had both attended the funeral services and had seen S. Maxwell Pierce laid out in his casket and that he, at least, Philip Farnell, had accompanied the body to its cremation. Morris's reply was, It's possible it was a wax image or something. I don't care, he concluded with a defiant cry that was almost a shout. Farnell threw up his hands. The doctor was bribed. The coroner was bribed. The undertaker was bribed. A wax model was made. Mal, for heaven's sake, what's put this extraordinary idea in your mind? The most ridiculous notion I've ever heard. A man of your age. Whereupon, Malcolm Morris proceeded to tell him that on two successive days in the past week, he, M.M., had seen S. Maxwell Pierce, and that Pierce had spoken to him. What had he said was Farnell's utterly skeptical question. Morris, pale, half ashamed, half distraught, looked at him squarely and quoted in a flat and hollow voice, Help, 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 help. Help. Much puzzled and not a little troubled at his old acquaintance's extraordinary and stubborn delusion, Philip Farnell resumed his walk home. The day continued beautiful, all the more so for the ever-increasing rarity of such days in and around Los Angeles, and by the time he reached his residence, the weight upon his mind was almost lifted. He prepared a roast of beef and put it in the oven, set the temperature low, and then went to his office in the rear of the apartment, intending to deal with the day's commercial correspondence, when, acting upon a sudden impulse, he got into his automobile and drove to Beverly Hills. At the rear of a spacious estate in that city, attending to the fruit trees espaliered against the stone wall, was a small and wiry man in a faded plaid shirt, baggy trousers, and a filthy felt hat. Philip Farnell approached him. Doc, he called. Dr. William Allen Albine turned, squinted, beamed, and advanced to meet him. Well, 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 Phil Farnell, he exclaimed, greeting him heartily. This is a surprise, a very pleasant one, I hasten to add. The two men shook hands and walked along, chatting of this and that and took seats in the patio, where an oriental manservant presently brought them drinks. They toasted one another's health, sipped, and then exchanged a silent look. After a moment, Dr. Albine spoke. I'm glad you came, Phil, he said. A great many of my old friends and patients do drop in to see me from time to time, even though I'm retired, and of course I keep busy, as I know do you, but... If I'd been asked to name one individual out of all of whom I'd be most glad to see today, I'd have named you, Phil. I'd have named you. And you'll never guess why. He looked at his visitor, and although Farnell smiled his gratitude at the compliment, nonetheless a shiver passed down his spine. You knew the individual whom I'm about to name Phil, Dr. Albine continued, and you were his friend, just as I had the privilege of being. To us, he was more than a mere figure of glamour, although far be it from me to deny the immense value of what he did in bringing that glamour into many otherwise drab lives, the public, but I mustn't make a speech. Anyway, I know you will receive what I'm going to tell you respectfully. He took another swallow of his drink without removing his eyes from the face of the guest, then removed the glass from his lips. One of the advantages of being retired is that a fellow can catch up on his reading. It's just what I was doing last night at about 10 p.m. I was sitting in my living room with a glass of milk and an apple, and I had some reading matter with me. The lamp was on behind my shoulder, and the rest of the room was in darkness. I had finished looking through Time magazine, and after that I started browsing a bit in the current number of the journal of the AMA. A man named 
Harrow has been doing some remarkable research at John Hopkins into those non-specific microorganisms, which so often masquerade as... But I don't want to bore you. You're a layman. I must have dozed off, and I woke up with a start. But you know how it is. I didn't at first realize that I was dreaming. I thought I was still awake. Dr. Albine told Mr. Farnell that he had looked up in his dream and saw S. Maxwell Pierce advancing slowly towards him with a perfectly silent tread. He had that gloomy expression upon his face, which I'd seen there so often, the physician continued, sighing and shaking his head regretfully. And I was just going to say to him, oh, come now, Sam, you old croaker, cheer up, when suddenly it hit me, great Scott, this man is dead, and at that moment, he spoke to me. Farnell said, don't tell me what he said, just tell me if I'm right, okay, doc? The doctor, astonished, nodded his head, and Farnell repeated the words, Help, 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 imitating as best he could the flat and hollow sound of them. The color ebbed from Dr. Albine's face. Then, slowly, it returned. He licked his lips. My God, Phil, he whispered. How did you know? Because you're the second person today who's told me the same thing, or almost the same thing. Mal Morris, you remember Mal Morris? A real old-time wardrobe man, used to be with famous players, used to be with old Jake Fox. Then for years and years he was with C.S., a heavyset man with a ruddy face, one of the first people I got to know when I started work out here. And Farnell recapitulated the circumstances of his meeting with Malcolm Morris on Hollywood Boulevard. Dr. Albine listened nodded slowly. Well, you know, Doc, some outfit has leased the old CS studio down on Santa Monica. It's been lying empty for years, and they have some sort of a deal whereby independent TV outfits can sublease part of it to make their films. And part of the deal is that the people who took it over from CS supply wardrobe to the subleasers, I mean, the sub lessors. Anyway, Mal Morris was bringing some items out of storage for the shooting. It was a jungle cereal, and he had a bunch of old-time pith helmets and stuff like that. You probably wouldn't remember, but coming from storage along the south end is an L-shaped corridor. And Mal says that he noticed as he went down that the lights were flickering in one arm of the L. And when he turned the corner coming back, they were almost out. And that's where, he says, he saw Sam Pierce coming towards him and saying just what I had said. And the next afternoon, the same thing happened, only over by where the old dressing rooms used to be. So tell me, Doc, what do you think it means? At first, all that Dr. Albine, who had been physician, friend, and counselor to the great and near great among the stars during the golden age of Hollywood, could do was shake his head. Then he muttered something to the effect of, extraordinary coincidence, and then he sat silent for a space of time. Philip Farnell broke the silence. Doc, he asked, what did Sam really die of? Albine's benign and wrinkled face turned savage behind his gold-rimmed spectacles. I'll tell you what he died of, he said, almost snarling. He died of overwork, worn out, worn out at 39. Isn't that a fine commentary on our so-called modern civilization? He died because he was paying alimony to two ex-wives, and the only way he could keep up with the payments was to borrow from his agent, and the only way he could pay back his agent was to make one picture after another as fast as he could with no time out for rest or recreation or leisure or the finer things in life. No wonder he had a heart affliction. No wonder he had an ulcerated stomach. I tell you, Phil, in California, a husband has no rights, which an ex-wife is bound to respect, and in my opinion, it makes a mockery of our fine old Anglo-Saxon legal system. With these cutting words ringing in his ears, Philip Farnell reflected, not for the first time, upon the unhappy story of Dr. Albine's sole venture into matrimony. And he did not say a single word, but shook his head.
Farnell drove back home pensively and found that his married sister, Mrs. Edna Carter, had arrived in time to rescue the roast from the oven, where he had completely forgotten about it, and had made sandwiches from it for herself and teenage daughter, Linda. You'd forget your head if it wasn't on your shoulders, Philly, was her greeting to him. He kissed the two women, mumbled an excuse, and sat down to eat, for, truth to tell, the untoward incidents of the day and the walks, as well as the ride through the clear air, had combined to give him an appetite perhaps somewhat keener than usual. After a while, he said, Edna, you remember Sam Pierce, don't you? His sister threw back her head and lifted one hand. Do I remember, she cried rhetorically. I will never forget him as long as I live. What a loss, what a tragedy, what a handsome man. One of the greatest actors of our day and age. Oh, come on, mother, said Linda in a scornful tone. S. Maxwell Pierce was a ham, and you know it. He wasn't even an honest man like Uncle Philly. Mrs. Cutter said, you shut your mouth and glared venomously at her child, just because he doesn't talk with his mouth closed and scratch himself. P. Farnell swallowed some roast beef. Why do you call him a ham, honey? He inquired. Have you seen any of his pictures in recent years? Linda said that she had. The dark side of the moon was on the late, late show. What a bomb, she said. Not just because he's pre-method, as Mommy seems to think I mean. I mean, some of those real old-timey actors like Frank Sinatra are a gas. But S. Maxwell Pierce, fooey, strictly from Hamsville. It had been years since Farnell had laid eyes on Roger Sherman, and he was far from sure that the latter would consent to see him. The ease with which the appointment was made and the fact that it was set for the following morning surprised him. Even more of a surprise, and a sad one, was the inactivity he saw on all sides as he entered the offices of Cahan Sherman Productions in the so-called New Studio in Culver City. He remembered when both the newer and the older C.S. studios were hives of industry, and although he had accepted that things were not with the silver screen as they once were, still, it was a surprise. The second surprise was what the passing years had done to Rod Sherman— the young lion of Hollywood he had been called once upon a time. The account of how he had wrested control of the studio from Sam Cahan in the days when the latter was still holding back cautiously from total conversion to sound, flying his private biplane across the country and interviewing Miss Yetta Meredith, widow of Isadora Meredith, co-founder of the studio, and then immediately flying his biplane back again with her proxy in his pocket. This is the stuff from which legend is made. But time had wrought many changes in the one-time young lion of Hollywood, and he now looked like a very old lion indeed, with hollowed eyes, hollowed cheeks, hollowed throat, and his nice leonine mane more scanty than otherwise. Little as Phil Farnell was prepared for this, even less was he prepared for the expression on Roger Sherman's face. The head of Cahan Sherman Productions glared at him, baleful, menacing, and hostile. Farnell felt taken aback. I'm waiting, said the movie magnate. I am waiting. Realizing that the man's time was valuable and not to be lightly wasted, Farnell plunged right into his narrative. It's about S. Maxwell Pierce, C.S. He said, I'll bet it is, said Mr. Sherman. I'll just bet it is. Then a flood of scarlet washed across his face and he all but lunged from his desk, pointing his finger and shaking his hand at the astonished visitor. Well, let me tell you that you won't get away with it, he shouted. I promise you and your rotten friends that. And then he sank back into his capacious chair and fumbled a capsule, a pill, and two tablets into his mouth and reached with a trembling grasp for the carafe of water. Without even recovering from his astonishment, Farnell pushed the jug within reach and waited until the medicine had been swallowed. Then he said, C.S., I, I do not understand. You understand, you understand, all right, the tycoon mumbled. A few drops of water glistened on his chin, and he wiped them off on one of the famous linen handkerchiefs with the monograms woven into them, especially for him at a factory in Northern Ireland. 
Don't tell me you don't understand. What, you're in cahoots with them? The whole rotten bunch of them? Darnley McKenzie, Emily Unger, Richard Rowe, Stella Smith, Sir Q. Fenton Stock, and all the others? I suppose it's just the powers of my imagination. I merely fancied I'd saw your name on the letter sent to me by that terrible shyster, Leonardo Del Bello. Ha! A faint glimmering of light came to Philip Farnell as he recognized the names of other players more famous in past days than at present. Please, C.S., he pleaded, don't excite yourself. Why do you take it so personally? It's true, certainly, that I and others have engaged Mr. Del Bello to represent us in discussions. Discussions! sneered Mr. Sherman. On the surface, discussion. Yes, and behind my back, what? Extortion! That's what it is, and you won't get away with it. And when I find out how you're doing it, believe me, my good man, you and all your fine friends will rot in the common jail. The William J. Burns Agency is on the track of your tricks right now. And so soon as they obtain conclusive evidence, the police. That's what. You forget with whom you have to contend. I wouldn't put up with it when the motion picture business was good, and I certainly have no intention of submitting to it without a wink or a blink when the motion picture business is no business at all unless a man of my standing is prepared to become a mere hired lackey or errand boy for the Chase Manhattan Bank. The millions and billions of dollars which the so-called stars they have nowadays are demanding before they'll consent or condescend to shoot a single frame. And then what happens? All the evil diseases of Egypt, from a hangover to a miscarriage. Meanwhile, the money's eaten up, while these temperamental cuties sulk in their tents like Alcibiades and watch television. 20th century? Why they deserve such fortune, and me not, I couldn't tell you. They strike oil on their lot, and part of the property goes for a high-class housing development. But does CS strike oil? Do you strike oil? That's how CS strikes oil, and who, may I ask, would be crazy enough to start, or even to consider a high-class housing development in Culver City? No one. Meanwhile, the costs continue and the debts mount up and the little shtickle income from renting the old studio on Santa Monica wouldn't begin to cover it. So what happens? I rent a few of the old films to television as an experiment and a desperation. They catch on. An offer is made to me by NBS for all the old films in our vaults, an adequate sum of money for the years of service and aggravation which I've given to the industry, and it would enable me to settle with my creditors for 100 cents on the dollar and end my career honorably and have a little peace and pleasure in the few years left to me by our Father in Heaven. So then what happens? Barely pausing for breath and a fresh sip of water, the head of Cahan Sherman continued, I'll tell you what happens, as if you didn't know, you snake in the grass. What happens? Every surviving motion picture performer who ever played a bit part in a CS production hires that Leonardo Del Bello, a money-hungry conniver from the word go, in the hopes that they'll be able to gouge from me a share in the money for the television sales and even the few rentals to the same medium. You know what this means, Mr. Philip Farnell? Farnell lowered his eyes from a photo portrait of the late S. Maxwell Pierce, which among those of other stars, both male and female, adorned the walls of Mr. Sherman's still lavish office. Why, Mr. Sherman, he said mildly, it seems to me that all it means is that all of those who helped create a picture will be able to share in the profits. We were paid, true, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining that we weren't paid well enough. Maybe some of us were really paid too much. But we were paid for moving pictures intended to be shown in moving picture theaters. Television opens up an entirely... A dangerous calm descended on the Lion of Hollywood. A faint smile began its tracings on his distinguished face. My friend, he said softly, let me explain to you. You are proposing to open the dike in order to irrigate certain fields of land. You think the water will flow here, it'll flow there, it'll flow exactly where you want, and it can be arranged just that way. No. No, my friend, not so. A flood is a flood. 
If the actors obtain a share of the proceeds from television sales and rentals, then everybody will obtain a share. The producer, he began to count on his fingers, the director, the assistants, the cameraman, the music arranger, the costumer, the carpenter, the electrician, the wardrobe man, the makeup man, the script girl, the salad cook in the commissary, the guard at the gate, everybody, literally everybody. So with everybody obtaining a share, what is left? Bubkiss, that's what's left. Goat droppings. I'm sorry you obliged me to use such a coarse expression, and CS Productions dissolves into bankruptcy. So you can understand my position. But what, and here he began to shout again, about your position? Sabotage, espionage, extortion, terrorist tactics. And you have the nerve to come in here and tell me that you're here about S. Maxwell Pierce yet? Shame, shame, ghoul, vampire. To use the form and the voice of your old friend, you're not ashamed. I'd just like to know how you did it, why you did it, that's obvious. To blackmail me and to squeeze your rotten ransom money from our depleted coffers, it's obvious. One single picture we've got in production and it hasn't cost me enough heartache, that bitch, Mephawide Evans, no. Two million dollars, a modest little sum at today's prices. She stoops to conquer in modern dress, as if you didn't know, you terrible person. The mogul's phrases came rapidly, abruptly, his chest heaved. And into at least half the scenes we've shot, you and your rotten crew, ruined, ruined, right over the scenes, like double exposure, that fink you hired to masquerade as S. Maxwell Pierce comes walking, comes walking, and his voice all over the soundtrack, help, 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 help. This time it was Philip Farnell's turn to reach with trembling fingers for the carafe of water. It was Luella Parsons' column, confused beyond correction, but mentioning both Pierce and Farnell and spelling their names properly, that brought duty Michael John to the old brown house in Cherimoya. She sat in the living room of his apartment, suntanned, healthy, and ill at ease. I suppose it's only natural that you were interested, he said, also a bit nervous, considering that you and Sam were such good friends. He'd been keeping me for years, as well you know, bless you, Phil, she said. Good friends, yes, I guess we were. He would have married me, too, if I hadn't been for Irma and Dorothy. At least, that's what he always said, anyway. I don't know. I just don't know. I never did. However, her voice lost its uncertain note and became brisk. This happened over a month ago. She rummaged in her purse, brought out a piece of paper, unfolded it. But I didn't understand it at the time. Mrs. Mulberry told me at the time. Mrs. who? Philip Farnell squinted, leaned closer. The burden of the entire affair was now weighing down on him. He would very much have liked to be able to get back to his Burmese airmails, his Rick's dollars, his complete collection of Gernsback, amazing, his business block and Chatsworth, and the other familiar items which had occupied his time before all this. Mrs. Who? Mrs. Phyllis Mulberry. She's a very well-known sensitive, Phil. I got to know her at the Spiritual Senate Church at Coenga Boulevard in connection with our Friday night Dutch suppers. And Phil, I want to tell you, she is marvelous. Simply marvelous. There isn't a thing to which she can't turn her hand. What she's done for the bedridden and the shot ins she can sing, she can paint, she has a pilot's license and a black belt, and a work with handwriting has attracted worldwide attention. Farnell felt himself utterly lost. All he could say was, go on. It was over a month ago. There were only the three of us, Mrs. Marbury, Laura Bender, and me. And it was at my place, Phil. You were never there. I had to give up the bungalow, Phil. It had too many memories. I live in a court in Boyle Heights now. Well, it was about eight o'clock, and suddenly it seemed to have gotten very quiet, and I looked at Laura, and she looked at me, and then we both looked at Miss Mulberry, and we saw right away that she had slipped into a trance. So I very quickly put a pad of paper and two pencils right by her hands. The soft lead Eberhard Faber Mongol 480, the kind she preferred. You know. Curious soft noises began to escape from the parted lips of the sensitive, but her hearers, knowing that they would never develop into coherent speech, wasted no efforts listening to them, but watched her hands instead. 
Old hands, strong hands, capable with mall stick and brush, capable with the organ and the judo hold, airplane controls and pots and pans, and now submitting to things utterly removed from any of those others. Hands grasping pad and pencils, hands writing. Farnell took the sheet of yellow paper handed to him, put on his glasses and began to read, or to try to read. He looked up. Duty, are you trying to tell me that one person wrote all of this? Do you think I'd lie to you, Phil? Laura and I saw it. Of course, you have to understand that she was just the medium whereby those who have passed beyond communication with us. Go on, Phil. No, I... Well, just let me read this. His voice died away. In a clear, Spencerian hand at the top of the paper, someone had written, Mother, 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 Dearest Mother, and had broken off abruptly, without even a trace of the final R. Immediately succeeding this, an entirely different handwriting began, small, cramped, bearing down heavily, quite incomprehensible. Farnell, looking at it in dismay, was not even sure that it was English. He was certain only that it was very ugly, and that, whatever it meant, it did not mean well. It vanished in a swirl of lines, as if there had been a struggle to seize the pencil. After that was a space of about an inch, followed by an address vigorously written. Mrs. H. M. Stevenson, 1327 Franklin Street, Riceboro, PA, and the words, Hi, Pipsqueak. Hank and Bucky, the bottom of the sheet was subscribed in a large, uneven, and faltering script. Our federal union, it must and will be preserved. And over this, on the slant, was something else which Farnell could not make out. He looked up, met her eager glance, shook his head. Means nothing to me, he said. I'm sorry. Duty Michael John gave a wordless exclamation, tapped her finger excitedly on the yellow sheet, then clapped her hands to her forehead. Oh, of course, Phil, take it. Hold it upside down and hold it up to a mirror. That one over there. Go on, Phil. Farnell obeyed. He saw reflected his own face. Those irregular and ugly features which had been his misfortune as a boy and his fortune as a man. Many thoughts went rapidly through his mind, but he forced his glance down to the reflection of the paper. All the writing was reversed and incomprehensible, and then part of it jumped suddenly into almost clarity. He tilted the paper until the slanting words were straight, then jumped, startled, his breath hissing. The woman came up behind him. There, she said. Now do you see? Yes, he said. I can see it now. Duty, help, help, duty, help, help stop them, or no peace for me, darling, D. Flicks, no, I've got to fade out. Hell. His quick and frightened respiration was the only sound for a second or two. Then duty said, We called up, you know, that Mrs. Stevenson, and she said everybody else used to call her husband Henry, and she was the only one who called him Hank, and Bucky was the name they had for their little child before it was born, only it didn't live. And she started to cry. Duty. But she managed to tell us that his nickname for her was Pip. Duty. That the veil of oblivion should be lifted to no better end than to exchange of domestic trivia or the proclamation of obsolete political slogans seemed suddenly intolerable to Farnell. Duty. This is Sam's handwriting. She seemed surprised at his surprise. Very quickly, she said, Yes, of course it is, Phil, and I finally figured out what it means, don't you see, Phil? I figured out what it means. He wouldn't appear to me, Phil. He wouldn't want to even faintly take a chance of frightening me. So this is what he did, you see? She chuckled faintly, fondly. He never was much of a speller. F-A-E-D-O-U-T. <laughs> That's one mistake he always used to make. And he was probably in a hurry this time, too, because who knows how much time he had, if there's any such thing as time as we know it there. 
Don't you see, Phil? Sam wasn't just a player, a mere mummer. Sam was an artist. Sam was an actor. He had, oh, such a tremendous talent, and he didn't use it in the movies. He couldn't use it in the movies. He was typecast, and he couldn't escape. And he needed money. He always needed money. Irma and Dorothy and their alimony. And so he let the studio push him into one piece of tripe after another, and that's the reason. She stopped abruptly. Looking away from Farnell, she said in a lower tone, That's not the reason. It's not the whole reason. He loved the rich living and the big house he lived in and the big houses he visited in and the big cars he drove. He loved the fine, fancy clothes he was always buying and he loved the stupid crowds at the stupid premieres. Every few months, another premiere for him because every few months, there was another picture. Philip Farnell looked at a photograph in a gold frame showing the beautiful features of S. Maxwell Pierce. The star's arm was around Farnell's shoulders, and the latter was looking at him with an affectionate smile, which made his face even more than usually ugly, devoid as it was of even the minor dignity of villainy. He was always talking of going on the stage, Farnell recalled. I'm going to throw it all up, Phil, he used to say. When this contract is up, I'm going to tell the studio where to go, and then it's New York for me. I don't care what parts I have to take at first or how hard I've got to work. Sooner or later, Broadway will give me the kind of part I want. And then, Phil, I'll be the happiest man alive. Duty Michael John nodded. S. Maxwell Pierce had told her the same things, too. Told them to her often, and often with tears. But he had never made the move. Had never been able to bring himself to make the sacrifice, do the hard work required. Not that the screen was a snap, no. Sometimes he had to be up at five in the morning after only a few hours of sleep to be on the set at seven. But once on the set, what did he have to do? Nothing. He just had to stroll through his lines, show his dimples, flash his teeth, take the girl in his arms, and that was it. It was easier for you, Phil, Duty said. Actors like you and Quentin Stark and Emily Ungar and lots of others, you looked on it as a job. You were round pegs and you fitted comfortably into round holes. But with Sam it was different. He knew that he was prostituting himself and he hated it, but he went right on doing it. He used to talk about that one talent which is death to hide. Farnell nodded, I know. He used to call it the real sin against the Holy Ghost. And then Pierce had died, worn out at thirty-nine. But at least, Duty said, at least he was at peace at rest. Until they took his old pictures out of the vaults and dusted them off and began showing them on TV. Because, you know, after he died, his popularity faded awfully fast. The pictures dated so quickly, the war and all. And there were newer and younger handsome men to take his place. And the exhibitors just stopped booking his pictures. And the distributors didn't even push them. But by now, you see, Phil, they're so old that they're quaint. Isn't that a terrible thing, Phil? Isn't that terrible? People look at those bits and pieces of Sam Pierce's heart and body and soul that he killed himself making, and they smirk and titter and yawn and reach for another can of beer because it's almost midnight, and they aren't sleepy enough to go to bed. It's just killing time to them, Phil, and it's just making money for the studio. But do you know what it is to Sam, Phil? Why, well, I only have to read this desperate plea of his for help, Phil. Each time I read it, it's an arrow in my heart. Duty, help, help, stop, then. That should be stop them, of course. Stop the people who are showing his old films. Flicks, no. That's what he used to call the movies, the flicks, flickers. You know, English slang. I don't know where he picked it up. Oh, Phil. She began to cry, and he awkwardly put his arms around her and patted her. That's what it means. That's why he's haunting people in the studios. That's why his face and his voice keep coming into the prints and the soundtracks of whatever it is they're making there. And why he shows up and appeals to all these people, Phil, because, Phil, as long as his old films keep on being shown, his soul won't be able to rest in peace. The matter was settled for the time being, at least, without too much difficulty. Roger Sherman, balancing television rentals for Dark of the Moon, starring S. Maxwell Pierce, against the losses being sustained in the making of She Stoops to Conquer, starring Miffin Wid Evans, was persuaded to make the experiment. 
Derek of the Moon was retired to the vaults one more, and with that, the ghost of S. Maxwell Pierce walked no more. How long it'll last, of course, no one knows. After all, Pierce starred in close to 30 pictures and appeared in many others made before he reached starhood. Sherman will not remain active in movie making forever, and when he retires, the complete stock of CS films passes out of his hands. Only his continuance for the present, plus the lawsuit, for it finally came to that, filed by the surviving old movie stars for a share in the TV rights to the films they played in, only these two things continue to keep S. Maxwell Pierce off the video screen. Philip Farnell awaits the future with patience, resignation, optimism, and, in this particular instance, no small measure of sadness. He had held S. Maxwell Pierce to be his close and beloved friend. He had silently, 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 and very deeply, too, envied S. Maxwell Pierce every atom of personal beauty and personal charm which Pierce had possessed and he, Farnell, had not. He had suffered in the great star's death, and this wound, which time had eventually healed, had been opened again. It had been opened afresh. Or was this yet another wound? And it still pained, and it still bled. For Pierce's shade, drawn from the valley of death, had sought out friends, had sought out enemies, had sought out casual acquaintances, and even strangers. But it seemed to have forgotten, utterly forgotten, that it had ever known Philip Farnell. So what'd you think? Ah, well, that story holds up. It really does. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I love the uh, I love the ending, which is kind of a surprise ending. And, you know, uh, and there's so many things in it that are worth thinking about or talking about, you know, the, the milieu of of, uh, of of the movie business. Uh, and of course, this is written in the early 60s. So uh, one of the things that strikes me in the story is the uh the way it's sort of is a nostalgic for the old hollywood of the big studios and and, you know by the early 60s uh uh there's a that's all falling apart okay and hollywood went on but the the times when the studios ran everything and studio executives were like you know emperors who were commanding armies uh no in fact i thought one of the Fun scenes and it's when the uh, the guy who's a producer Shepard is that his name in the story uh, Roger Sherman. Sherman Roger Sherman is complaining about he's trying to make a movie and he really hates it that now the actors have so much control and you know and they and they get sick they can't you know they're spending millions of dollars waiting for the actors to be ready this is exactly a description of what happened with Cleopatra which was being filmed in the early 60s mm-hmm. and uh uh you know uh elizabeth taylor got really sick and meanwhile she's having an affair with richard burton her marriage is <laughs> breaking up and all this stuff and you know uh i think it was 20th century fox was losing millions of dollars were waiting around to make this movie uh spectacular and i i think uh uh Auburn must have had cleopatra in mind when he wrote that that harangue by uh by uh, Roger Sherman. Yeah. Well, a, a, a couple of a couple of interesting things that, that I noted. Number one, I don't know if you're aware of this. Avram lived in Hollywood for a time or in L.A. Uh, and he lived at, and, and he worked at a hotel. And I, I, I've been reading his adventures in autobiography, which hasn't been published yet. And he talks about the different actors in Hollywood. And he certainly had written some stories and books that were meant to be certainly meant to be films and he had a couple of short stories uh that were made into uh, i think the alfred hitchcock episodes uh-huh. you know, david carradine and whoever played hot hot lips Houlihan in mash oh uh the the, the movie so he, yeah. was, he definitely was a part of that scene and i think he wanted to be more of a part of that scene so you know i, I think he, that was part of the story i think no question about it you know, what was really kind of cool the way it evokes, uh, you know, that that era and how the characters, I mean, there aren't any really, the people who are in it are older, okay? I guess there's the daughter of his sister, his niece, uh, yeah. 
Philip Farnell, but that Farnell himself has got to be like 60 years old by the time this this story is is, is happening. And, uh, you know, his friend uh, Pierce has been dead now for what, 20 years. OK. And and uh, uh, and so, you know, we're talking about the 30s and the 40s here, uh, uh, which really is the the high point of the studio era. And, uh, you know, it has uh, allusions to things. I, I don't know where I heard this. I don't know if I heard it or it came to me on my own uh, and I made it up, but uh, I, I, I wondered for a long time that whether uh, the uh, S. Maxwell uh, Pierce is based on uh, Errol Flynn. Okay. So, so super interesting. So I don't know. I was wondering that and I started going through all the different characters and saying, is it, you know, who is this? Who is this? Because all of them definitely did things like that. He would pull from from real real people. You know, he was definitely married three times. Uh, he was a little bit older. I even checked when his birthday, when he died, which was not the same date, because he said that Sam Maxwell Pierce died. I always think there's some hidden meaning just the day before Pearl Harbor. So it'd be December 6, 1941. So I was like, could yeah. you know, he didn't die that day. So Anyways, but it's possible, definitely, or it could have been someone else, or it could have been a number of people sort of merged together. Uh, I think Roger Sherman, I think, is probably, and I, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, is uh, Louis B. Mayer from MGM, because MGM Studios uh -huh. in Culver City, and he was the Lion of Hollywood, and in here they called him the Young Lion. So I think, I'm not right. sure, but I don't know. Oh, and MGM always had the Lion as their logo there. Right. Uh, at the, at the front. Yeah. And, and Flynn, you know, he lived, uh, he lived, I think, till the late, late fifties. Okay. So he didn't die at the, at the time of Pearl Harbor, but uh, he lived, uh, you know, he, he drank and, and had sex with everybody in sight and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, was not really particularly engaged with uh, doing great performances. He was a swashbuckler, you know, and yep. the stories uh, were on the surface. And if he had any, any, uh, uh, thespian uh, uh, ambitions they they didn't show in the in the films that he made and yeah, they were immensely popular made a lot of money made a lot of movies and he, you know he sort of wasted himself uh, so I don't know if that's that's at all but was in Avram's mind but I, I thought it's kind of interesting to, to do that yeah and I, it's it definitely I was I was really trying to see if I could figure out who each person was but I but I couldn't I'd love if, if someone out there has some ideas let us know but, yeah. uh, but I, I kept working at it. You know, part of the story that I, I felt fa I was fascinated about is it was really powerful too. I mean, there were powerful moments, things like, you know, uh, Philip Farnell in terms of the very last sentence where it says basically, and I didn't notice it the first time, but Sam Maxwell basically Pierce forgot about him. Right, right. Well, that, that was so sad. But to me, that's the that's the heart of the story to me is the relationship between Phil Farnell and and Pierce, which is really not spoken of a great deal. But by implication, the fact that that, uh, you know, uh, Farnell is is uh, knows all the people that that are being visited by uh, by Pierce's ghost. And, uh, you know, this this feeling that he had, uh, I mean, what the story, the personal story is, is. Here's the other thing is that Phil Farnell, the fact that he was a character actor and he was born really ugly. He's an <laughs> ugly man. OK, he's not a handsome man. He's an ugly and he and he, he played villains all the time. And, and he's so good. He's so good. He's, he's such he's a good, good guy. I mean, he wouldn't even ever be mean to the script girl. OK, he was he was completely uh, humane. He's a mensch. He okay. sends quarters. He sends dimes back that he finds. Right. In the right. Oh. right. And so, you know, he's been incredibly faithful to his friends and supportive and all this stuff and lived a very, uh, you know, modest, but but uh, positive life. And and uh, yet he's the kind of character who is dismissed in the movies. OK. And and, uh, uh, you know, he's never a headliner. He's always a villain or the you know, second henchman or something like that. And and so uh, but he had this friendship. And so the, the final uh, uh, irony, of course, that that Pierce didn't visit him, visited oh. everyone else, even people who were like the was a wardrobe guy who, who <laughs> got visited by by right. but, not, but not Farnell was supposed to be one of his closest friends. And, and this sort of, uh, you know, it, it also hits me about it's about loss. 
and about sort of the surfaces of things, the way they look versus what they're really like. You know, Phil Farnell looks ugly. He's really decent. Uh, as Pierce, Maxwell Pierce looks as handsome, okay, and dashing, and, you know, sounds like he's fundamentally hollow, okay? And, and, uh, and, and he d doesn't, you know, Pierce, Pierce didn't value that friendship, okay? And, and whereas Farnell did. And, and so it's sort of weird how, uh, if you have something like that where you have an unrequited love, where you care for somebody and then you discover that, you know, you think they care for you and then you discover, no, they don't. Wow, what a, what a tremendous loss that is. So for a ghost story, ghost story you think is gonna be scary and there may be some scary moments in there, but in the end, it's, it's not really a story that depends on scaring you. I think yeah. it's more about, you know, touching you in the heart about the sense of loneliness and loss and sadness that comes at the end. Yeah. Do, do you think, do you think that there is, and I was thinking about this and you actually made me think of something else, which is number one, do you think that there was a depth to Sam Pierce though, or Sam Maxwell Pierce in that he wanted to do things really that were meaningful, you know, he, he wants to fade out. He wants to go away because he doesn't want people to see these awful movies. He wanted to go to Broadway and do things that were meaningful. Uh, right, right. That's actually, I think, absolutely. That's the saddest thing about him is that maybe he did have ability. Maybe he could have played Hamlet. OK, but no, he he, he played these roles where he, you know, what it, uh, it says that he he would walk onto the, the set. He, you know, he'd kiss the woman and, uh, you know, be handsome. And that that was all he had to do. And, uh, you know, there, there's a, a there's a sense in which Hollywood surface here is is glamorous. And then underneath there are all these things that the story mentions that are not so easy and they're human, but they're painful, like uh, like the actress who got pregnant and wanted an abortion and and begged the doctor to give an abortion and he persuaded her not to do it or the or the there's divorces. OK, all that that and there's overwork and disillusion. OK, there's ham acting. These these crappy movies that are on the late show. Uh, there's the decline of the studios. Um, you know, there's Pierce destroying his his life with the high life. Uh, you know, uh, uh, he there's a, someone says, I think was it his mistress says that he didn't want to do the hard work it would have taken to have real a, achievement as an actor, you know, or or the other way of saying that is maybe that it was it would Hollywood offers you so much if you're successful. So much, you know, sex and money and drugs and alcohol and partying that uh, life in the fast lane that uh, that it's easy to lose yourself. You know, that that's there, you know, and, and and you made me think a little bit about even today that that we hear about actors all the time who are stuck in this cycle. You know, the actors who are having to take, you know, do 10 movies that they sign up for and they're almost bankrupt. And yet right. we do right. all these movies over and over again, exactly kind of this sort of cycle. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, uh, I, I mean, maybe they live, you know, they live at the edge of their means, I guess. OK, yeah. or or they're they're They outlive their their popularity. OK, you know, maybe you're a young matinee idol when you're 25 or 35. But when you're 55, especially if you're a woman. Uh, you know, it's 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 a cruel business. And, and you know, maybe some of them, the male actors last into their 50s and 60s. But uh, but there are ones that don't you know, that that fade out, you know, that are that are really big, you know, huge names. And then and then they're forgotten, you know, you know, you, you brought you brought up one other point. Just it's very, very, very small. But I, I know Avram in a lot of his writings, children always have a certain sense of are able to perceive things that adults may not be able to perceive. And I think Linda is the, is the niece. The niece. Calls, right. Yeah. Calls um, Sam Maxwell Pierce a ham, as you just said it a second ago. And I wonder if that's a, a younger person having perception that, uh, right. that, that others may not have. Well, um, also it sort of shows how people can outlive their time and how, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, what we think is really good from a previous generation to the young people, they look at it and say, well, what's the big deal with that? Okay. You know, that's old fashioned or it's, it's corny. You know, I, I let's face it. Uh, you know, I, I, 
was a teacher, am a teacher for many years, uh, young people don't want to watch black and white movies. Okay, they can't imagine that <laughs> that there's anything good in, in those movies, you know, or or the or the special effects are really really not up to our current standard, and so you know they can't be bothered to watch a movie, even if it's something like you know Casablanca, okay, which is you know a great movie, or the or you know. Uh, 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 the Maltese Falcon or some, some, you know, mm -hmm. some great black and white film of the era, uh, you know, they just, they can't understand why, why anyone would like that. You know, it's just a different idiom. Well, well, talking about movies, obviously, and this is all about Hollywood. I, it's kind of ironic. I always do this thing where I say, who, who would, if we adapted this particular story, who would play the parts? And so I, I came up with, with four main folks, uh, Philip Fernell, Sam Maxwell, uh, Roger Sherman and uh, Duty Michael John. Uh, did you did you have any thoughts on that? And then you know we could take turns. I could give one. You could give one. Yeah, I'll, let's let's work through them. Okay, I, I had okay. some ideas. Okay, so so who would you want to have for Phil for uh, Phil Farnell, the main character? So so it depends on how the movie's made, right? Because if they flash back to earlier scenes and then come to later scenes, it's going to be tough. But I, I chose uh, uh, Rami Malek. Uh, the person who played uh, Freddie Mercury in Bohemian Rhapsody. Ah, as a young version. Yeah. As a young version, but he could also be made to look older. You know, the way he was able to move around his facial features in Bohemian Rhapsody, I think you could do some interesting things with Isn't him. Isn't he a little too handsome to me, Phil Farnell? I, I, think, <laughs> I, I think you could do some things to make yeah. him, I, I do, he's got that sort of that face that is handsome, but could also be made to look kind of mean and not handsome yeah yeah okay what about you well i was going more with uh, uh phil as he would be in the story so i'm thinking yeah. he's an older guy so i was thinking uh you know my ideas were steve Bus buscemi mm -hmm. or oh. or or paul giamatti uh who are not classically handsome guys okay but <laughs> uh you know you could see them them being uh that character okay well, so so um I think the first, uh, what's the first one you said? Um, Steve, Steve Buscemi, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, my gosh, great call. I think a great call. And and then I'm gonna do a follow-up, which is, cause it's kind of ironic. Who do you think, I'm gonna skip a little, who do you think would be the right person for uh, Roger Sherman? Well, I was, I was, had a little more trouble with that one. I thought, you know, I'm thinking he's Jewish tycoon. Okay, so I was thinking Eugene Levy, okay, okay. as, as uh, you know him. Uh, no, but, uh, uh, he was him? most recently. He's well known for the show Schitt's Creek. He's oh, the okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been in many comedies. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, I brought that up because I actually chose Paul Giamatti. Ah, okay. That <laughs> that, well, he could do it. He could do that easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually thought a, a weird, more offbeat characterization for him would be uh, Woody Harrelson. Okay, uh, you know. Uh, who, who you know, it, it can be like an action hero, but he's also can play really uh, uh, what questionable characters. You know, Sherman is sort of in between there. He's a he's a uh, obviously in, in, used to uh, telling people what they should do and they do it. And now his his power is declining. So uh, I think that's I think it's a great call. All right, how about uh, um, let's see, uh, Sam, um, Sam Maxwell Pierce. Well, again, I was going for someone who was older, but still, I mean, he died in the, in the, when he's 39 in the story. Right. So I thought he could be played by, you know, Bradley Cooper or Brad Pitt. It's a Brad's, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> someone's really, really uh, handsome, uh, but might be a little bit, uh, you know, wearing out around the edges. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I, I, I went with, uh, he's 40, uh, Ryan Gosling. Oh yeah, you know I thought about Ryan Gosling. Okay, exactly. Uh, yeah, would do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, suitably, oh, go ahead. You know, he's suitably handsome and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and how about a uh, duty, Michael John? Oh, I thought I thought this was a role that was meant to be Kate Blanchett. Okay, okay. Uh, you know the ex mistress. She's older too now. Okay, uh, and so uh, she was. Uh, you know, he would have married her, except he had alimony for his two previous wives, <laughs> or maybe that was just what he told her. But at any rate, he didn't marry her, but he did try to contact her. And uh, and she seems, uh, 
it, like she legitimately cares. She's the one really who solves the mystery. Yeah. Okay. And 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 settles the ghost. <laughs> I lost. You, I lost you there for a quick second. What? A, what? So I, I went okay. with a, a Scarlett Johansson. Oh, okay. I thought. Well, that. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay. You know, if you're if you're having flashbacks to that that time, I think Scarlett, yeah, works great. I mean, I and I guess she's getting up. I don't know. She's probably is she forty yet? She might be. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, well, what? A, I mean, I am so thankful that you chose this particular story i again it really grew on me more and more as i as i read it and listened uh you know i know you've had speaking of adaptations i know that you've had a short story i think done i know your wife uh has had some, some a whole season uh done I mean, maybe talk a little bit about that and your experience or anything that you'd want to share well my, my only experience that has actually made it to the screen was a short story i wrote called a clean escape which is adapted for a, a very short-lived abc show anthology show called masters of science fiction and it was uh, they did a good job with it they it was it starred uh judy davis and sam waterston and i got to see them film some of it up in vancouver and uh it was uh, it was great. It was directed by uh, oh God, the guy who directed on Golden Pond that movie. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name now. So that was that was it. You know, they paid me well for it. I did not write the script, but uh, you know, they followed my story. Uh, the core of it followed my story pretty pretty well. So I was very happy with that experience. I've tried various other things, but I've never had anything get very far. Uh, yeah. Um, I, my agent and I, my agent is, uh, uh, Vince Gerardis, who is really quite well respected there, um, have pitched this TV show, uh, and came close, but haven't, haven't been able to sell it, uh, again, based on some stories that I wrote. Uh, my wife, however, has, has, uh, her name is Teresa Ann Fowler, and she's a very successful novelist, uh, had a couple of bestsellers. Uh, one of them, a novel called Z, a novel of Zelda Fitzgerald, and it was made into a series on Amazon called Z uh, that was about Fitzgerald and Zelda. And uh, they made a whole season of it and they greenlighted the second season. But then as they were going into production, uh, the head of production at Amazon changed and they they uh, pulled the plug mm -hmm. on the second season, which was a big disappointment yeah yeah well i really hope someone reached reaches out to you about another orphan that that's my that's that's my hope because i'd love to see that on the big screen well, thank you uh you know i'm i'm, I'm ready here i'm available i'm, I'm <laughs> waiting by the phone so just uh just pick it up give me a call <laughs> well you know john I, I i can't thank you enough this was a ton of fun uh you know don't feel free to visit again love to do this I, I, I definitely will. And uh, uh, this is a wonderful project you're doing to bring these stories to people's attention. So uh, it's, a, it's a mitzvah you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, let's do this again. Yes. Okay. Take All care. Right. Thank you.